Will Goldstein here, uh, thekingscourt.com, and so another opportunity to uh, subscribe and, uh, you know, get more people here, tell your friends, spread the word, follow my music by uh, looking at the about page and you'll see all the links to all aspects of my music. So this is the uh, name of this, well it's in the series, World Unity Series, and it's um, number 12. So the title of this video is Taoism or Taoism. It's spelled with a T or with a D. And subtitle would be Harmony with the Way or Path. So symbols in uh, Taoism are, you know, the yin yang. So yin yang is, can be described in different ways, uh, but they're all sort of similarities, meaning um, uh, world polarities, dualism, dichotomies, light, dark, a male, female, life, death, opposites. So um, that's why I chose <laughs> the yin yang with the white, white and the black. Um, so before we get into this, the main figure of this is um, it was founded, Taoism was founded in the 6th century uh, BC by uh, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, also called Laozi. Uh, he was credited with writing the Tao Che Ching. So uh, before I start, <laughs> the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu. So first I'd like to read it. Um, it's a short little poem. It's the first poem in this book. It's, not, it's called One. And then, you know, um, this, <clears throat> you know, there's interpretations, obviously, from the Tao system. But, you know, it's interesting. I, when I first read this book, I thought, gosh, you can, you know, maybe it's, I apply it differently than people in the Tao religion. But it's interesting because it really can be understood. This, this poem could be written in a Christian context. And that's why I just want to read it first the way it is without any interruptions and then kind of go through it again and and give a, an inter because that's what I find fascinating about it I in fact when I first read this book I thought I should write a lot of songs <laughs> based on <laughs> some of the ideas in, in this in this book but uh, the first one is called one the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao the name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of 10,000 things. Ever desireless, one can see the mystery. Ever desiring, one can see the manifestations. These two spring from the same source, but different in name. This appears as darkness darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery. So that's the opening uh, first one in this book, um, you know, by founder of Taoism. So I'd like to kind of read it again and maybe within a little interjections <laughs> to give you just, I think it's just kind of fun, at least for me to do this, uh, to give insight in how you can really interpret this. You know, otherwise you might read it and go, well, what does that really mean? The Tao that can be told, um, and that to me would be God and the universe, because that's the Tao that can be told, is not the eternal Tao. You know, we, it's not the eternal Tao because we only see the powers of God. We only see the universe. We don't see a, a you know, monotheistic God that created. And now Taoism doesn't even really acknowledge that. But from a Christian point of view, that you could look at it that way, you know, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. Now, just because Taoism doesn't acknowledge it doesn't mean that Lao Tzu didn't. <laughs> the name that can be named is not the eternal name, again. So we can name all the things that we see. We can see the stars, we can see the heavens, we can see the sun, the moon, the universe, uh, God's creation. Um, but that is really not the name because it, it came from somewhere. So the nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. So whatever force that is or God, that is the beginning of heaven and earth. Um, the named is the mother of 10,000 things. 
So whatever that is, that force, that power, that God, that's where all this world and universe is coming from. You know, the, the light of life <laughs> from a Christian point of view. So uh, ever desireless, one can see the mystery. We can see the mystery of the of mind of God. Okay, ever desiring, one can see the manifestation, manifestations. So, um, so he's desiring, you know, that we see this. So he in himself is ever desireless. So it's a mystery who that is because he that force doesn't really need anything because it is the source of everything that it is. These two spring from the same source. So wherever that, whatever that source is, I would call it God, um, the mystery and these manifestations come from that one source. This appears as darkness because we don't really understand it. It's hidden from our view. It's veiled from our, our insight. Darkness within darkness. The darkness within darkness would be the powers that we see, the manifestations that we see in God's creation that's coming from the mind of that power, that force, that God or, or whatever that is creating all this. This is the gate to all mystery. Well, I just thought that would be kind of fun to uh, do this. So this is a, a great little book. Really uh, loved reading this book. I highly recommend it. Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. And so now I'm going to get on with the video here. So um, again, uh, he's also called Laozi, born in 571, a legendary ancient Taoist uh, philosopher. He wrote the Tao Te Ching, just like I said. He's uh, generally translated uh, as the old master. Adherence to uh, Taoism are predominantly in China and Taiwan. The World Religion Database estimates there are about 8.7 million Taoists. Taoism refers to a Chinese philosophy, so it's more of a philosophy than a religion, really. Uh, it's a set of traditions that emphasize living in harmony with the Tao, the way or path. It really means the ways or you could say the path. The Tao is generally defined as the source of everything and the ultimate principle underlying reality. Tao Te Ching by Laos and the Zhuangzi, an ancient Chinese text from 476 to 221 BC, somewhere in there, which contains stories and anecdotes that exemplify the carefree nature of the ideal Taoist sage. The two texts are there widely considered as the, the main uh, Tao texts, or those two texts, and are distinctly philo philosophical in nature and theme. So Taoism includes various self-cultivation methods, including meditation, internal alchemy, that kind of like the state of your mind, and various rituals and how to work with that internal alchemy. And not just the state of your mind, there's internal alchemy, but there's also Chinese medicine, working with the body and working with the soul. So you're working with those two aspects. So common aims include becoming one with the natural flow of the Tao, longevity, they really are uh, are pursuing long life, longevity, becoming a sage, and even an immortal. So, um, Taoist ethics vary depending on the particular school. They generally tend to emphasize virtues like inaction. That's a big one, inaction. Let, the, let it flow. That's kind of like the essence. Of, uh, it is what it is, and let it unfold and flow. It's inaction. Okay, because if you act, then you're interrupting the natural flow of nature. Uh, naturalists, so whatever happens naturally, or spontaneity, simplicity, and the three treasures are compassion, frugality, and humility. The roots of uh, Taoism go back at least, like I said, to the 4th century BC, and its cosmological view from the school of Yin Yang, uh, known as the naturalists, some other influences include Shang and Zhao dynasty religion, Mohism, which is an ancient Chinese philosophy in ethics and logic and rational thought, and science developed by the academic scholars who studied under the ancient philosopher Mozai, Mozi, so thus Mohism uh, from 470, and Confucianism, an ancient Chinese belief, belief system which focuses on the importance of personal ethics and morality and more than that. 
Um, Taoism had a profound influence on Chinese culture in the course of the centuries, and Tao masters attributed only to the clergy, uh, Chinese internal alchemy, Chinese astrology, uh, Zen Buddhism, martial arts, including Tao Chi, traditional Chinese medicine, Feng Shui. These are the influences that it gave on Chinese culture. Feng Shui, an ancient Chinese traditional practice which claims to use energy forces to harmonize individuals with their surrounding environment, and many styles of Olong, uh, Oingong, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, developed in China thousands of years ago as part of traditional Chinese medicine, which is very big, uh, that involves using exercises to optimize energy within the body, mind, and spirit with the goal of improving and maintaining health and well-being. All these have been associated with Taoism throughout history. So yeah, Chinese medicine's a big one. I've been to yeah, I've been to a Chinese doctors. In fact, my second cousin is a doctor in Chinese medicine. So today, the Taoist religion exists in the People's Republic of China, Hong Kong, Maku, single sphere, which is East Asian countries like Taiwan, China, Korea, Vietnam, Japan, including Korea and Japan. These are all places where it is there and has a significant number of adherents in a number of other societies throughout East and Southeast Asia. It's mostly in the East, the Far East. Um, particularly in Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam. Taoism also has adherents in the West, there are some, which includes East or Southeast Asian immigrants as well as Western converts to Taoism. So Tao can mean way, so it usually is way or path, but it can mean way, road, channel, path, doctrine, or line. Uh, uh, Livia Kohn describes the Tao as, and I quote, the underlying cosmic power which creates the universe, supports culture and the state, saves the good and punishes the wicked. Literally, the way uh, refers to the way things develop naturally, the way nature moves along and living beings grow and decline in accordance with cosmic laws. We don't want to interrupt the natural flow. It's all based on cosmic, natural cosmic laws. The Tao is ultimately indescribable and transcends all analysis and definition. Thus the Tao Che Ching begins with, the Tao that can be told is not eternal Tao, <laughs> like I just read. <laughs> Likewise, Kamjathi writes that Tao has been described by Taoists as dark, indistinct, obscure, and silent, the darkness within darkness. So it's, uh, it's obscure. So in other words, look at nature. How did it get here? And th that's about it. Dark. Don't know. You know, unless, unless you get some sort of divine revelation, which is basically what the the Holy Bible is a divine revelation to take you out of the darkness. <laughs> but anyway, so according to Kamjathi, the Tao has four primary characteristics. Uh, it's a source of all existence, so whatever it is. Uh, it's unnameable mysteries, whatever it is, they don't know what it is, all-pervading sacred presence, and universe as cosmological process. So whatever that power, whatever that force is, whatever that God is, it's a cosmological and there's a universe and it's in process. So as such, Taoist thought can be seen as monistic. The Tao is one reality. Pan en Henic seeing nature as sacred, that's what that means, and panentheistic, the Tao is both the sacred world and what is beyond it, imminent and transcendent. Similarly, Chan describes Tao as an ontological ground and as the one which is natural, spontaneous, eternal, nameless, and indescribable. It is at once the beginning of all things and the way in which all things pursue their course, following the way of the Tao. The Tao is thus an or organic order, which is not a willful or self-conscious creator, but an infinite and boundless natural pattern and I added the words, thus pantheism. They're describing pantheism. So notice it is that it said, 
is is not a willful or self-conscious creator there's no like in christianity or in judaism you know the world was created let there be light god spoke the world into existence ex nihilo that's what they're saying their view is not that furthermore the Tao also is imminent in individuals natural and we're all part of the Tao. <laughs> it's imminent in individuals natural and in social patterns thus innate nature of all people uh, a nature which is seen by Taoists as being ultimately good kind of in the christian judeo-christian concept we were created good but then there was the fall in a naturalistic sense the Tao has visible pattern the Tao that can be told for example the rhythmic processes and patterns of the natural world which can be observed and described so we can talk about the Tao but we can't really define what it is thus Cohen writes that Tao can be explained as twofold the transcendent ineffable mysterious Tao and the natural visible and tangible Tao so we can we can see the world and we can see that it exists and we don't have a clue how it got here uh, throughout Taoist history Taoists have also developed different metaphysical views such as nothingness um, negativity not being spontaneous self-production self-transformation and twofold mystery so they uh, de I'm not sure how to pronounce it but they the act of express expression of Tao <clears throat> is called day translated as virtue so it means virtue or power virtue or power uh, that results from an individual living and cultivating the Tao and refers to ethical virtue as in a Confucian sense a higher sagely virtue or power which comes from following the Tao and practicing Wu Wei the pra and that's the practice of taking no action that is not in accord with the natural course of the universe and is thus a natural expression of the Tao's power but not anything like conventional morality rather the manifestations of one's connection to the Tao a beneficial influence in accord with one's cosmological attunement so in other words you don't interrupt what's naturally happening you're in in line with the natural flow of the, co of the cosmological attunement so Zeran, Z-I-R-A-N, um, literally is self, so, so self-organization is regarded as a central concept and value in, Tao, in Taoism and as a way of flowing with the Tao. It describes the primordial state of all things as well as a basic character of the Tao and is usually associated with spontaneity and creativity. According to Kohn in the Zunanzi, Zeran refers to the fact that there is thus no ultimate cause to make things what they are. There's no ultimate cause to make them what they are. They just are. The universe exists by itself and of itself. It is, ex it is existence just as it is. Nothing can be added or subtracted from it. It is entirely sufficient upon itself. To attain naturalness, one has to identify with the Tao and flow with its natural rhythm. That's why I keep saying the word flow, go with the natural rhythms of what is, as expressed in oneself. This involves freeing oneself from selfish, selfishness and desire and appreciating simplicity. It also involves understanding one's nature and living in accordance with it, without trying to be something one is not or overthinking one's experience. Just be. It is what it is. I am what I am. <clears throat> One way of cultivating Zeran found in the Zhuangzi is to practice the fasting of the mind, a kind of Taoist meditation in which one empties the mind. So now we're getting into concepts of contemplation. They call it meditation in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And other sources too, you know, might call that contemplation. It's the emptying of the mind to experience the presence of God. But it's the emptying of the mind to receive. So here they're using it in terms of Taoism as a meditation which in which one empties the mind. It is held that this can also activate uh, key vital energy. In some passages found in the Zhuangzi and in the Tao Te Ching, naturalness is also associated with rejection of the state, 
So now we're talking about society, the state, anarchism, and a desire to return to simpler pre-technological times, basically called primitivism. So going back to the way nature really is, we're ruining the world by all our technology. Let's just go back to the basics. So an often cited metaphor for naturalism is um, the uncut, uncut wood, poo. The uncut, or also called the uncarved log, which represents the original nature prior to the imprint of culture of an individual. It is usually referred to as, as a state one may return to. Like I say, go back to the basics, the simple way of life. More on the Wu Wei. So the term Wu Wei is the leading ethical concept in Taoism. Uh, Wei refers to any intentional or deliberate action, while Wu carries the meaning of there is no, or lacking without. So in other words, the Wu Wei is no deliberate action, doing nothing in essence, okay? So just letting it happen, following the, the way, the path, uh, the flow. Common translations are non-action, effortless uh, action, um, so just being natural, spontaneous, um, action without intent, so just being, um, non-interference and non-intervention, so just let it play itself out, don't interfere with what's going on, don't intervene, it's just taking its course. The meaning is sometimes emphasized by using the expression action without action. So your action is no action. <laughs> and involves letting go of ego, egoistic concerns and to abstain from forceful and interfering measures that cause tensions and a disruption in favor of gentleness, adaption, and ease. You know, so if you're intervening, you're just gonna cause trouble and there's gonna be a fight or hostilities. You know, they're trying to present it as just let it be, a gentleness, adapting to what's happening, and just be at ease and let it happen. In ancient Taoist texts, Wu Wei is associated with water through its yielding nature and the effortless way it flows around obstacles. Taoist philosophy, in accordance with the I Ching, proposes that the universe works harmoniously according to its own ways. When someone exerts their will against the world in a manner that is out of rhythm with the cycle of change, they may disrupt that harmony and unintended consequences may more likely result rather than the willed outcome. Thus, the Tao Te Ching says, ah, and I quote, act of things and you will ruin them. Grasp for things and you will lose them. Therefore, the sage acts with inaction and has no ruin, lets go of grasping, and has no loss. Taoism does not identify one's will as the root problem. Rather, it asserts that one must place their will in harmony with the natural way of the universe. It is what it is. Thus, a potentially harmful interference may be avoided, and in this way, goals can be achieved effortlessly by uh, Wu Wei, the sage, seeks to come into harmony with the great Tao, which itself accomplishes by non-action. So it's accomplishing what it's doing by not, our non-action. Aspects of the self. So the Taoist view of the self is a holistic one, which rejects the idea of a separate individualized self, but rather to the broader set of realities in which all people are naturally and properly embedded. Um, we oneself or nature is ultimately the Tao expressing or manifesting itself. We are just a way of the Tao manifesting itself and connected with one's heart, mind, or consciousness. So they, they, heart, mind to them is consciousness, the heart and one's spirit, the intellectual and emotional center of a person involving the emotions thoughts, consciousness, and the spirit within two conditions possible for heart and heart mind, or the original heart mind pervades Tao and is constant and peaceful. This is just the way the Tao is expressing and manifesting itself, okay, through these ways. Terms used to describe this state are an awareness, the awakened nature, original nature, original spirit, and they call it uh, the scarlet palace. 
this pure heart mind is seen as being characterized by clarity and stillness, purity, pure yang, spiritual insight, and emptiness. Taoists also see life as an expression of the Tao. The Tao is seen as granting each person a life destiny, which is one's corporal existence, one's body and vitality, cultivating a holistic psychosomatic form of training uh, described as dual cultivation of innate nature and self-destiny. Taoism also believes in a pervasive spirit world that is both interlocked with and separate from the world of humans. So the cultivation of innate nature is often associated with the practice of stillness or quiet meditation, while the cultivation of life destiny generally revolves around movement-based practices like a dial yin, a series of cognitive body and mind unity exercises involving meditation and mindfulness to cultivate essence, health, and longevity. So they're dealing again with the body and the mind. Okay, Taoists are very much in tune with the three treasures of traditional Chinese medicine and work with ancient Chinese understandings of the body, its organs, its parts. Uh, they use the term elixir fields, inner substances such as essence, animating forces, and meridians or channels, and is used for health practices as well as spiritual transformation and uh, psychosomatic transmutation or internal alchemy. They're trying to improve all that and work on that. So Taoist physical cultivation rely on purifying and transforming the body's key, which is the vital breath energy, in various ways such as dieting and meditation. So that's what it's all about. It's all about the body and the uh, heart mind, or the consciousness. According to Livia Cohn, Qi is the cosmic energy that pervades all, the, the concrete aspect of Tao. Qi is the material force of the universe, the basic stuff of nature. According to the Zunzongzi, human life is the accumulation of Qi, which refers to the rhythmic energy that constitutes each and everything. And Taoism, energy and matter are one and the same, thus all people are actually key itself. So death is its dispersal, so everything is the key, we're key. Everyone has some amount of key and can gain and lose key in various ways. Therefore, Taoists would hold that through various key cultivation methods, they can harmonize their key and thus improve health and longevity and even attain magic powers, social harmony and immortality, they even believe. The Nai, the inward training, is one of the earliest texts that teach key cultivation methods. He is also one of the three treasures found in Taoist physical practices like King Kong, which QI. G-O-N-G, -G, however you say it, within Chinese medicine and Nadon or internal alchemy. The three are essence, the foundation for one's vitality, Qi, or the rhythmic energy, and Shen, or spirit, subtle consciousness, uh, capacity to connect with a, a subtle spiritual reality. So these three are further associated with the three elixir fields or three cinnabar fields. They were considered to be the palaces of the gods and the body and the organs in different ways. So now we're getting into ethics. Naturalness, spontaneity, simplicity, detachment from desires, and most important of all, were we in, in the flow without deliberate action. According to Taoist, humans are are originally and naturally aligned with Tao. Their original nature is inherently good. I think I said that before. But we have fallen away from this due to personal habits. That's how we fell. Desires and social conditions. Kind of like the fall. And now, you know, with Adam. Uh, and return to one's nature requires active attunement through Taoist practice and ethical cultivation. Some of the most important virtues in Taoism are the three treasures of the three jewels, translated as compassion, moderation, and humility, or not daring to act as first under the heavens, implying abstention from aggressive war, capital punishment, simplicity of living, and refusing to assert one's authority. So in other words, we want simplicity of living, and we don't assert one's authority, and we don't do capital punishment or promote aggressive war. So Taoism is also a, di 
adopted the Buddhist doctrine of karma and reincarnation into its religious ethical system. So they do, obviously, that's what it states, believe in reincarnation. So medieval Taoists developed the idea that ethics was overseen by a celestial administration. <laughs> now we're talking about some of the other um, you know, topics that, that I've talked about, you know, the, the gods, small g, uh, celestial administration, which kept records of people's actions, so we're talking about karma here, and their fate, as well as handed out rewards and punishments, so there is some sort of punishment, through particular celestial administrators. <laughs> this sounds very much in line with Christianity. So, um, but these are, instead of really the God, they're, they're just powers. So, there's, so it sounds like there's some advanced um, spirit world, you know, that they be, obtain immortality and then they're higher in the ranks of a spiritual world. So soteriology, um, that has to do with salvation and religious goals. So Daos have diverse religious goals, which include Taoist conceptions of sagehood. So a lot of Taoists want to be sages, grow in wisdom. That's basically what a sage is. Spiritual self-cultivation, a happy afterlife, and or as longevity in form and some form of immortality, understood as a kind of transcendent post-mortem state of the spirit as to what happens in the afterlife, the soul becoming a part of the cosmos. An illusionary place where key, the basis of Tao philosophy and medicine uh, and physical matter are thought of as being the same in a way held together by the microcosm of the spirits of the human body and the macrocosm of the universe itself represented and embodied by the three pure ones, uh, the universal or heavenly chi, human plane chi, and earth chi. And chi means the life force, the energy that flows through you and through everything. These aid the spiritual functions of nature after death, where one is being saved either by achieving spiritual immortality in an afterlife or becoming uh, Xion, who can appear in the human world at will, uh, but uh, normally lives in another plane. For example, um, sacred forests or mountains or uh, yin yang or Tao. Um, uh, realm is where they would dwell in an inconceivable, inc incomprehensible by normal means in a place where the virtuous Confucius and Confucianists exist. So this is the where they would exist, a spirit world, in a mental realm sometimes called the heavens where higher spiritual versions of Taoists such as Laozi were also thought to exist for when they were alive, they absorbed the purest yin and yang of all possibilities to be re reborn in and seen as beings that can manifest in that world as mythical beings and they manifest themselves possibly as dragons who eat yin yang and the two complementary forces that make up all aspects of and phenomena of life, the actual process of the universe and all that is in it and often depicted as light and dark energy and therefore they ride clouds and their key. So the vital energy of life force that keeps a person spiritual, emotional, mental and spirit and physical health in balance. So they're like dragons riding in the clouds, you know, with this force behind them. So other possibilities for the spirit of the body. So again, we're talking about salvation and spirit, spirituality after death, really. Um, include joining the universe after death, exploring or serving various functions in other spiritual worlds, so they believe in other spiritual worlds, kind of like the Jains, or becoming an Exion who can do one or more of those things. Taos um, Exion are often seen as being eternally young because of their life being totally at one with the Tao of nature. So in other words, they're so in tune with in, in harmony with their bodies and through Chinese medicine, you know, uh, and uh, their mo heart mind and their consciousness and dealing with that imbalance and, and, and creating this yin yang that they, they tend not to age. So they have longevity. They uh, tend to be seen as a, eternally young because of their life being totally at one with the Tao of nature, being made up of pure breath and light for an afterlight 
afterlife of natural paradises and palaces of heaven. So even when they do finally die, that's, that's the goal, paradises and palaces of heaven. The chalice are sought to become one of the many different types of immortals, such as Ixian or Henran, wanted to ensure complete physical and spiritual immortality. The goal of some is, like I said before, is to become a sage, which equates with being a spiritual immortal, the attainment of clarity and stillness through the integration of inner nature and worldly realities. So they're just in flow with nature and, and rea worldly reality. Sages flow with the natural way of the Tao and thus embody the patterns of the Tao and are considered to be perfected persons and attaining salvation in Taoist soteriology. They live simple lives as craftsmen or hermits and sometimes are depicted as ideal rulers, ruling through non-intervention under which nations may prosper peacefully. Sages are the highest human beings, um, mediators between heaven and earth and the best guides on the Taoist path. They act naturally and simply with a pure mind with Wu Wei doing nothing. They may have supernatural powers and bring good fortune and peace. Some sages are also considered to have become one of the immortals through their mastery of the Tao. After shedding their immortal form, these now spiritual mortals may have superhuman abilities like flight and are often said to live in heavenly realms. The sages are thus because they have attained the primary goal of Taoism, uh, a union with the Tao and harmonization or alignment with its patterns and flows. This experience is one of being attuned to the Tao and to our own original nature, which already has a natural capacity for resonance with the Tao. This is the main goal that all Taoist practices are aiming towards and can be felt in various ways, such as a sense of psychomatic vitality and aliveness, as well as stillness and a true joy or celestial joy that remains as well unaffected by mundane concerns like gain and loss. The Taoist quest for immortality was inspired by Confucian emphasis on filial piety. So they, they worshipped their ancestors because they thought they existed after death. Ancestor worship. Becoming an immortal through the power of yin yang in heaven, but also um, specifically Taoist interpretations of the Tao was sometimes thought of as possible in Chinese folk religion. Taoist thought on thoughts on immortality were sometimes drawn from Confucian views on heaven and its status as an afterlife that permeates the mortal world as well. So they're very much in, in tune with Confucius. So the cosmology on uh, the school of naturalist uh, key and Taoism and death cosmology is cyclic. The universe is seen as being in constant change with various forces and energies key affecting each other in different complex patterns and focuses on the impersonal, spontaneous, and unguided transformations of the universe. Unguided. Okay, it's just nature flowing, pantheism. Rooted in the concept that creation Tao rested in deep chaos. Well, this is interesting. So it's kind of like evolution. It started out in, in chaos and then evolved into the one, um, you know, a concentrated cosmic unity full of creative potential and described as the great ultimate. The One then brought forth the two energies of yin and yang, merging in harmony to create the next level of existence, the three yin-yang combined, from which myriads of beings came forth from the original oneness, and thus the world continued to move into ever greater states of distinction and differentiation. It's from further emanations up. <laughs> because it started with chaos. That's, where the, that's the reason why I say it, it seems like it's the reverse, at least to me, because it started with chaos. So that would be more in line with evolution, starting from chaos and then building up. Whereas in Neoplatonism, there is a transcendent God and it's going down. So it's actually the reverse. The main distinction in Taoist cosmology is the yin-yang applying to all sorts of complementary ideas such as bright, dark, light, heavy, soft, hard, strong, weak, above, below, male, female, and so on. 
These two forces exist in mutual harmony and interdependence and are further divided into phases such as minor or major and correlated with substances. So the main elements that they are associated in Taoism are wood, fire, earth, metal, water, and that's in that order respectively. So this schema is used in a variety of different ways of thought and practice, from nourishing life and medicine to astrology and divination. Taoists also generally see all things as being animated and constituted by qi, by layer, and subtle breath, which is seen as a force that circulates throughout the universe and throughout human bodies as both air in the lungs and as subtle breath throughout the body's meridians and organs. So blow up air is and oxygen is just flowing through the entire being. Ghi is in constant transformation between its condensed state, life, and its potential state. So it's always in transformation. These two different states of Ki are embodiments of yin-yang, complementary forces constantly playing against and with each other, and one cannot exist without the other. Okay, so it's a constant embodiment of this change, this duality of states, um, or forces. So Taoist texts present various creation stories that are non-theistic. So again, it's non-theistic. I think it's non-theistic just because, who knows? that there's no revelation from God to them, like in the, for example, in the, you know, the, the Holy Bible, where there's revelation, there is no real revelation. And, it, and perhaps this is, I'm, I wouldn't go, I would go so far as to say that, that because I believe that God is working with all humanity, that, you know, there is sort of some sort of revelation coming from God to Lao Tzu. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and but that, that's the this is the, as far as it went. So, um, but anyway, so Taoist texts present various creation stories that are non theistic, a natural, uh, undirected process in which an uh, apophatic process of negation in terms of what may not be said, but and di differentiated potentiality that's called Wu Wu Ji without non differentiation. And that naturally unfolds into Wu Zhi, a primordial oneness or non differentiation, which then evolves into yin yang and then into a myriad of beings. However, later medieval models also included the idea of a creator god. Aha! So medieval models of the Taoism did incorporate that idea of a creator god. <laughs> because it just makes sense. Uh, which was mainly seen as Lord Lao, which represents order and creativity. Taoist cosmology in turn influenced Taoist soteriology, which holds that one can return to the root, which is Guru Jing, of the universe and of ourselves, which is also the Tao, the impersonal source of all things. In other words, um, Neoplatonism. So humans, because you're returning, in that sense you are returning to the one. So if you look at it from two different perspectives, if you look at it from chaos, then it's returning to, it's evolving up. If you look at it from Neoplatonism, it's there's an emanation down. <laughs> it's yin yang. <laughs> uh, and this is all within Taoism. So <laughs> humans are seen as a microcosm of the universe, and thus the cosmological forces are also present in the form of the Zhang Fu, or yin yang organs. Another common belief is that there are various gods that reside in human bodies, and therefore a deeper understanding of the universe can be achieved by understanding oneself. They're really into Chinese medicine and into the organisms, acupressure, acupuncture, all that sort of stuff, you know, flowing with the meridians and the channels, and, um, you know, to improve one's health. So another important element of Taoist cosmology is the use of the Chinese astrology, which I didn't really get into because it's, it's, it's already super long. Theology and eschatology beliefs regarding death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. So Taoist theology can be defined as apophatic, given its philosophical emphasis on the formlessness and unknowable nature of the Tao. So it's negative. In other words, the only thing we can say about the Tao is what we don't know. <laughs> that's, that's apophatic. It's negative theology. And the primacy of the way rather than the anthropomorphic concepts of God. 
some forms of Taoism, probably the main forms, that they're, they're focused on the way rather than on some concept of an anthropomorphic uh, god that may or may not be there. This is one of the core beliefs that nearly all the sects share. However, Taoism does include many deities, so even though they're not really sure about this god, this creator god, they do believe there's deities, supernatural spirits, um, and thus can also be considered animistic because of that, um, and polytheistic in a secondary sense, since they are considered to be emanations from the impersonal and nameless ultimate principle. Uh, principle. So these spirits are emanations from that nameless one. Okay, so that's kind of like angels. Yeah. <laughs> Some Taoist theology presents the three pure ones at the top of the pantheon of deities, which was a hierarchy emanating from the Tao, and as such, Laozi is considered the incarnation of one of the three and worshipped as the ancestral founder of Taoism. So again, that's Laozi or Lao Tzu that I read in the beginning. Different branches of Taoism often have differing pantheons of lesser deities. Uh, so there's a hierarchy, for example, the same hierarchies that might exist in the writings of Dionysus the Arabic regarding Christianity, where their deities reflect different notions of cosmology. Lesser deities also may be promoted or demoted for their activities. So there's a hierarchy of ranging, of, of ascending or descending, according apparently to their service. <laughs> <laughs> Some varieties of popular Chinese religion incorporate the Jade Emperor Yu Huang or Yu Di, one of the three pure ones, as the highest god. He's an emperor, so he wants to be the highest god. <laughs> His historical Taoist figures and people who are considered to have become immortals, and they're called Exion, are also venerated as well by both clergy and lay people. Exion is spelled X I A N. The, the immortals. So despite these hierarchies of deities, most conceptions of Tao should not be confused with the Western sense of theism. Being one with the Tao does not necessarily indicate a union with any, an eternal spirit in, for example, the Hindu theistic sense. So it's not a union um, emerging uh, into the Godhead, it's just a union in a sense of um, getting closer to um, the whatever that concept or that force is, but not a, a pure union integrating within that. And that's what they're really trying to say, an integration. Because in some forms of some forms of thinking, uh, you know, the, the ascent of the human soul can actually merge into and sort of become God. That's not really a Christian concept where we ever, because we can't become the creator. But some forms believe that there is this sense, and, so, and we're merging into that, becoming one with that. The nine practices are non action, softness and weakness, guarding the feminine, being nameless, clarity and stillness, being adept, being desireless, knowing how to stop and be content, and yielding and withdrawing. So those are called the nine practices. Uh, meditation, there are many methods of Taoist meditation, often referred to as stillness practice, some of which were strongly influenced by Buddhist methods. So again, you know, you're getting into this idea where, you know, you think about the, you know, this, the, the Tao is really on the far eastern side. So you notice, you know, like the Buddhism and things like that are more, you know, um, Indian or from Nepal, or someplace like that. And of course you had Thomas in the uh, the Apostle Thomas went to India, you know, and bringing that kind of, but in this, you also have the Silk Roads and all this idea of, of things like Judaism and Christianity and Zoroastrianism and all these things moving across that Silk Road and the Indus Valley uh, path, you know, where all these ideas are going forward. But the farther you, that you get into the Far East, there's less concepts of for example, a transcendental God, because they're farther removed from that concept because they are at the end, the Far East. But, you know, they did pick up, because of that, they picked up some of these practices that were being done, ancient practices 
For example, it's highly likely that this concept of stillness practice was picked up, it could have been picked up from just ideas that traveled along that road that might have originated from <laughs> the Hesychus movement in the third century or something like that. You know, in, in Christianity, it, it's really hard to say. So some of the key forms, um, they, or it could be vice versa. Some of the key forms of Taoist meditation are apophatic or quietistic meditation, termed fasting and heart the heart mind, or embracing the one, guarding the one, quiet sitting, and sitting forgetfulness. So they're just sitting, they're just absorbing whatever it is, an absence of thought. This type of meditation emphasizes emptiness and stillness. It is con contentless, content contentless, no content. We're not thinking about anything. It's non-conceptual, there's no images involved in it. It's non-dualistic, a process by which one simply empties the heart-mind of all emotional and intellectual content. Classical Taoism state that this meditation leads to the dissolution of the self and, and any sense of separate dualistic identity, and this practice is also closely connected with the virtue of Wu Wei or inaction. So they see it as a virtue of inaction and the dissolution of the self. So their goals are different. So in, the, in Christianity, for example, in the Hesychus movement, which is the same practice, the goals are to receive some uh, enlightenment. Uh, so do you have to empty your mind so that you can receive enlightenment? So this is actually emptying the mind so that you dissolve the self in inaction which the per so the purpose behind it is completely different. Concentration medita uh, meditation, focusing the mind on one theme, like one of the writings of Lao Tzu, like the breath or, or something like that, like the breath, a sound, a part of the body, a mental image, a deity, is called guarding the one, which is interpreted in different ways. And meditation in Christianity would be more thinking about some, some scripture and, and thinking about it over and over again in all its applications. So they're looking at it more as you're concentrating not on some sort of spiritual wisdom, like a, a writing of Lao Tzu, but you're concentrating on your breath or a sound or part of the body, a mental image, a deity. And again, that's called guarding the one, which is interpreted in different ways, such as observation, which encourages openness to all sorts of stimuli and leads to a sense of free-flowing awareness that often begins with the recognition of physical sensations. So they're observing what's happening in the body and subtle events in the body, but may also involve paying attention to outside occurrences. So you could even be even listening to something that's happening out there, a bird fly flowing by. Um, you know, singing. <laughs> Guan, G-U-A-N, meaning city gate or close, close, the city gate, is associated with deep listening and energetic sensitivity. The term most often refers to inner observation. So they're, t they're really paying on what's happening within me, know thyself sort of concept, a practice developed through Buddhist influence. Now again, entails developing introspection of one's body and mind, which includes being aware of the various parts of the body as well as the various deities residing in the body. So they're really, these deities are residing within the organs of the body. There are different positions involved in the meditation. They could be standing meditation or various other postures. Visualization of various mental images, including deities, cosmic patterns, the lives of saints, various lights in the bodies, organs, or other methods associated with Taoism. So that's it. I hope you uh, enjoyed this video. That was a very long video. There's an extraordinary amount of information in it. And But anyway, um, hey, uh, it's, it's a great book. You know, if you want to read, I really love this book. I highly recommend it. Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. All right, and you translate it. There's probably many translations of it. So again, an opportunity before you leave to subscribe and maybe check out my music on the about page. And uh, hope you enjoyed this um, uh, video. It was um, I learned an enormous amount by doing this video myself.